You know, a lot of times this stuff costs a lot. It really does. You know, obviously if you're here talking about deer habitat, making deer habitat improvements on your land or on someone else's, then you most likely recognize the the overall cost of that land. You're either making the payments or you know someone's making the payments. And typically, um, most people in the area, you kind of have an idea, you know what land is going for, for per acre. And so we're typically, when we're talking about these habitat improvements, we're talking to people that own land, recognize the cost of land, are willing to spend money for that land. But at the same time, a lot of you were able to purchase this land because you saved your money. You worked really hard for a very long time, like I did, and you're able to purchase this land and you want to make sure you don't waste any money. You made smart decisions to get to this point and I want to see you make smart decisions when it's coming to your habitat. So that's why every month we talk about the uh, top five deer fails or January deer fails, January or February deer habitat fails, March, because I want to make sure you're on the straight and narrow when it comes to not only spending money, but spending your time. So a lot of these equate to dollars, but you can imagine with a lot of these two come a lot of time that you can waste as well. So let's just jump right into it. And we'll talk about sugar beets. The sugar beets there's even Roundup Ready sugar beets that people try to get a hold on, you know, hold of just like gold. But what you'll find is sugar beets need to be planted fairly early. When the deer figure them out, they eat them down to the dirt very quickly. It's not something you can typically plant unless you cage them in. And a lot of people don't make that. And so sugar beets can be a great addition to a food plot program. I know someone up in the UP of Michigan, he has a quarter acre that's near enough to his house that he can irrigate it. And he plans on getting four to five tons of sugar beets in just a quarter acre. He fences off completely, opens up the fence in early November, and lets a deer pour in, and he's got four to five tons of food and forage waiting for them to do so. Pretty cool if you think about it. There are certain applications for sugar beets, so these are not all money wasters here. There's obviously a place for most of these, but at the same time, a lot of times they're buzzwords. For example, people add sugar beets to a brassica blend. Sugar beets need to be planted several weeks, if not two months before most brassicas. So they're not a good addition to a blend. What they are is a good buzzword to get you to buy that bag of seed because they're not going to be appreciable enough in the mix to matter and they're a very expensive seed. So sugar beets, I've seen very many plantings that fail with sugar beets because the deer eat them down to the dirt. I've even seen people that use them one year in a very small setting. The deer don't realize they're there, what they are, and they they were incredible attractions in a small spot with a lot of forage per acre for one season. The next season, they didn't even make it to the hunting season because the deer recognized that spot, they recognized the food source, and they ate them down to the dirt before they could be appreciable enough and actually last into the hunting season. So consider sugar beets as an option for some, but not most, and more of a buzzword, especially when it applies to mixes, that you can plant them with and expect them to be or offer something appreciable. Soybeans, the number one food plot failure that I see, and I'm not saying soybeans don't have their place, they do. I like to see soybeans where people have weed control problems, they're trying to build a deer herd, they can be a great summer food source in that location you're trying to build that deer herd but you have to have enough they do not tolerate browsing pressure so i've seen many soybean fields that never got above four to five inches high and certainly never made it to the beginning of hunting season here in minnesota the previous owner had about five acres of soybeans they're down to the dirt by early october and because of that 90 percent of the uh, real estate listing pictures that we had for this location we're all velvet buck pictures because there's no food source going into October and November. So not a lot of hard to horn antlers because those mature bucks, those oldest bucks, they'll go find the food. So if it's down to the dirt, it's not going to be there. Also, I've had people say, well, I'm going to plant soybeans and they're going to be around for the late season. And so I want those there. And I, I, I know people that only plant soybeans. Well, now they can't be a herd influencer because the deer weren't on their land during October, November, September. In a warm December, they're not even there till the end of December typically. So they're missing out and they're only getting the leftover bucks. The bucks that everyone else had a chance to shoot, kill, hold, protect, advance to the next age class. Maybe they don't even leave their land because they're doing a better job of managing year or uh, season long food source, season long cover options and browse. Instead, yeah, people that are only planting them late and it doesn't really amount to anything. But most of the time, when it comes to soybeans, people are spending a lot of money on high dollar soybeans for very little, if any, in a lot of cases, none in return 
because those soybeans are eaten down to the dirt and don't make don't fool yourself don't make excuses why well, help the deer during the summertime you didn't help them when you actually offered soybeans at a time when the local habitat and other food sources were a 10 out of 10 you weren't offering that much of a difference you didn't really do anything for the deer herd because if they're dead in November those little bucks because you didn't protect them or if you didn't have a great hunt with all the money you're spending during the off season if you really didn't add body weight or antler mass to those deer then why plant it you can't just pat yourself on the back because it looked pretty in june and july when it wasn't around in october november and that's why soybeans are the number one failure i see and they're very expensive miscanthus grass miscanthus grass can be a great tool it's very appropriate under power lines along roadsides where you can't plant trees shrubs it's a very good tool but we've stopped a lot of clients from planting a half mile screening five rows 12 to 18 inch spacing $3,600 with miscanthus grass when they could have just planted 50 bucks worth of switch grass an hour of time instead of three days of putting rhizomes in or using even a machine planter to do it and expensive resources miscanthus grass is a great tool it's got its place that's why I have a bud over here I have a bud on sugar beets beans miscanthus grass a lot of these have their place but it's a limit of much. It's kind of like hinge cuts. Hinge cuts don't cost much other than wasted resource. We recommend them to about 20% of all client properties, 15%. Dylan, you've been to how many clients this year? And you just told me you recommended hinge cuts for the first time. Yep. Just, uh, just, just the other day. Last weekend. Yep. And I, I just use them in a very, you know, niche situation. Yeah. It, and part of that is it applies to a low percentage of the habitat, but then like we discussed, there's a lot of people that shouldn't be out there with a chainsaw cutting hinge cuts. Right. So that's that's another portion. Now we, we work with a lot of people that are handy with a chainsaw, but not everybody is. And if you've never been handy with a chainsaw and you're going out there to practice cutting hinge cuts by yourself, not a, not a good practice, not a good you know, outdoor activity to go out and spend some relaxing time. And uh, because of safety, and uh, the risk to injury is very high with a, with a chainsaw. So, but when it comes to miscanthus grass, it does have its place, really good places. But far too many people use it far too often and spend a lot of money when they could have used those dollars elsewhere. Deer ponds, this will bring up some controversy, but there's a but. You know, deer ponds are great. I see, we want to put a pond out here behind the house. We want to have fish in it. We want to have a little beach area. That's perfect. But we're not putting a deer pond on the property because we think we're going to attract all the deer in the area because they need a quote water source. I want the water sources to be the little tubs that I hunt over right in front of a tree stand. You put a half acre pond or a quarter acre pond or an acre pond in an area, that's not this little secluded area where whitetails just flock to the shoreline for you to just hunt from a tree stand nearby. Instead, call them for what they are. They're great for fishing. They're great for family use, for beaches. They're awesome for swimming. Swimming floating deck, awesome for that. But putting a pond on your property because you think you're gonna attract a bunch of deer, again, that's a wrong focus. Not to say that a pond isn't great for you or it's not a great activity, but it's not going to attract more deer to your land. It's not gonna define deer movement. It's not gonna complement a deer movement in any way. And a lot of times when you're offering water in the wrong location, it's taking away from areas that could use water to help define movement and to actually give you a great bow hunting hotspot. You know, we talk about putting uh, even water holes out for hunting situations. To me, it's almost a sin in my book. If you can't shoot to with a quality bow stand that you could access in and out, then it's probably a very poor spot for a water hole because just because you have a great water hole on your land that attracts deer, not a good thing unless it's attracting deer in or by or at your tree stand. Number five, food plots in general. If you're creating food plots, that attract a lot of deer in the neighborhood to the location only to have you spook them away. And that food plot is not only wasting a lot of dollars, a lot of time, but it's wasting an incredible amount of opportunity for you to be an actual herd influencer and have a great hunt. It's actually tearing away from your ability to have a great hunt and to be a herd influencer and build a big herd. Because if you're pushing deer off your food plots only to have them come back at night, you're not only gonna have fewer bucks coming into your land after dark. But a lot of times they just don't come onto your land after, after dark at all because they just recognize your property as a nocturnal parcel only, a place they don't wanna be during the daylight and their most sacred places in the woods are the lands that they want to actually be attracted to and they want to go to during the daylight, 
not after dark. So if your food plots are causing nocturnal use on your property, then just look at your food plot budget, how much you're spending to get those food plots in place. And it's definitely a waste. You'd be better off without those food plots than creating a nocturnal partial because of the food plots. And there's a couple honorable mention here. CRP mixes, we talk about that all the time. We have a video I'm talking about where we're looking at ag land and CRP mixes that are bad for whitetails and why it's a bad investment. People will say, Dylan had this uh, discussion with a potential client just today or yesterday, and I saw online a comment. You know, someone went in a three or four paragraph um, comment on YouTube, and unfortunately, I don't have time to read those. I just saw the gist of it for the first couple sentences. And uh, if it would have been maybe a couple sentences, I might have taken the time to re read it and answer it a little bit. But I just don't have the time, unfortunately, to look at all those. I want nice, short, concise comments. And I'll try to address those as much as I can. But we do put out 208 videos a year. I do address YouTube tells me over 10,000 a year. So that's a lot to begin with. Um, but we just can't keep up with them all. But what they're saying is, you know, some of us need that CRP in ag land to offset the cost of the land. And I look at it and I break it down in another video. The cost of that CRP or, or ag land that you have for the rent and that income coming in, there are far, far, far better investments that you could put your land in, whether it was rentals, storage units, something you could buy with that money that would actually be a better use of that money as it relates to the long-term investment for your family. In fact, several times more in most cases, and we talk about just using the average rental house and how much that would typically rent for when it actually does cash flow and it's not a negative, and compare that to what you would rent the ag land for or even CRP, which is worse. So you have that aspect of it, but then a lot of times you're spending a lot on CRP mixes are very expensive. Some of the, the straight pollinator blends can be $400 an acre or more, and then if you have an install that's even more, so you're spending a lot of dollars per acre and then your return on wildlife if all that cover is just laying down all winter people even say well we have great wildlife from april may june through september well, that's not when the wildlife actually needs it they need it during october november december january february march that's when all the cover is gone that's when wildlife populations die we have lots of rabbits on the property but by the time we get into march if we want to go hunting in march there's not a lot of rabbits left because they're getting picked off by predators so now we have nine ten acres of switchgrass we're making rabbit huts out there and so we want to save those rabbits for the long term but their winter cover is the most critical that's the lowest toll in the bucket we have rabbits all over in the summertime but that's not how you score your whitetail property your wildlife property and when it comes to tractors Think about it this way. This year, on this property right here, I'll have 15 and a half acres, 16 acres right around there, food plots. Now I'll have corn planted. I have a friend come out, they plant corn with their tractor and with their planter. And if they didn't do it, I'd find somebody else. The other eight acres, the two and a quarter acres that I manage in, in Wisconsin, then I've had other properties I've worked on too. There's another one that's four acres in Wisconsin too that I've worked on a lot of four acres of food. So I've worked on as many as 18 acres just by myself with my own equipment and I don't need to use a tractor. We talk about those ways and I'm not saying you don't have a tractor. We actually have a four wheel drive little Kubota tractor. We use it to mow the lawn and our trails. I might use it to spread seed someday with a cone shaped broadcaster. Might pull a brush hog on it to actually get down on the woods where the, where the, uh, the regeneration and the debris that we're mowing is a little bit beefier. But other than that, we're not using it as an actual food plot machine. We do everything with side-by-sides, ATVs, sprayers, handheld equipment, call the packers like our Packer Max, incredible tool. That's what we're planting with and I'm doing that. I'm planting that actually faster and just as effective as other people that have tractors and without that expense. In the UP Michigan, I had a tractor up there, put over 500 hours on it. I used most of that those hours towards clearing the land, pushing over conifers, putting them on piles, clearing eight acres of food plots. I also used it for clearing snow off my driveway. But I didn't have my tractor, I don't know what I would have used. I used the front end loader. We had a really wide driveway and we'd get 160 inches of snow. So I could use that, that front end loader, had a heated cab, I could push the snow around, it was perfect. Here, we had the option, do we pay someone to uh, plow our driveway or do we get a tractor, blower, spend 30 grand, spend an hour or two of our time every time it snows, or do I pay someone 60 bucks to do it 10 times a year and call it good? So think about that cost balance. 
I'm not saying to go out, not go out and buy a tractor. I'm just saying that it is honorable mention one of the habitat deer habitat items that people get the bug to to and i'll tell you when i was buying tractors a tractor when i was shopping for that tractor when i was looking online when i was learning about tractors it was pretty darn exciting i couldn't wait to get a tractor i couldn't wait to call it my own i couldn't wait to smell that tractor it's something about it i got bit and i enjoyed it i put over 500 hours on it but as it related to my deer habitat needs i realized at some point at about hour 505 that i didn't need it for my deer habitat goals and i plant a lot more acres of food plots now and do a lot more on the land than i did before but i do it as effective or more by not using the tractor so consider all of these potential deer habitat dollar wasters this year and Dylan, I'll put you on the spot. Can you think of anything else that we haven't covered here? Dylan's the one that I, actually pointed out tractors. We've actually had a video about that in the past, but. Uh, I think switchgrass can be a huge habitat money, money waster. Yeah. Because I unfortunately just spoke with a client this week that I can't remember exactly how many acres he planted, but it didn't grow. Yeah. And at 10 pounds an acre and 15 bucks per pound, that's a very, very pricey failure. Yeah. So make sure you're doing it right. And like we talk about, you know, switchgrass is one of the easiest things to plant and easiest to get established when you follow the rules. You have to have a, a plan for taking care of the weeds if they come in. You have to uh, have a plan for eliminating the weeds before you plant. You have to have a plan for mowing. And when you do that, pretty good success. It I works. mean, yeah, we've, we had a video last year. It's four easy ways to plant switchgrass. And we'll go over those and we'll go visit those areas this year be cool to actually go out right now because we can see some of them coming through the snow but um very effective ways to plant switch but you have to maintain switch and we were talking about in another video just one or two videos ago switchgrass to me is one of those it's like the toilet paper syndrome in early covid days where people are stockpiling seed because they heard they might need it or they need to have it in their stockpile and they have no plan no plan for maintenance no plan for how it fits on their land no plan for weed control they just heard switchgrass is good and they're doomed from failure before they even pushed by and added it to their cart. So yeah, switchgrass is a good one too. So a good honorable mention, or maybe should have been one of the five, not to say again, switchgrass is bad. It's one of those butts, like everything on here, every habitat tool has its place, but not every habitat tool can be used everywhere and is appropriate everywhere. So think about that. We wanna keep you from not only spending that money, but your hard earned time too, and making sure that you're, you know, again, you, you search for land for years, you made a smart decision, you made a great investment for life that should carry on with your deer habitat expenses to that same smart decision. I hope this video helps you out because there's a lot you can waste your money on besides these that we've mentioned right here. Folks, I want to make sure you check out my web class video series, whether it's how to design your food plot program or how to design your property in general. And we have a new one coming out that'll be how to hunt the rut. But these bucks back here are testament. Some of these bucks go back to 93. They're even in different states. I urge you to check out those web classes so that you can help yourself, help your land, help your hunt. The link is in the description. And also for those that have tried them out, I encourage you to offer some feedback in the comments below. Thank you.